Hi guys, um, so we're from Team Generos. Uh, we're a standby block producer for the EOS network. And I'm here with uh, Ralph, one of our team members, and also Tom with the iPhone down there. He's uh, one of our team members as well. Um, so today we're going to go through, um, introduce who we are, what we do, and our recent projects, and also go through um, EOS and what EOS does. So that's why I brought Ralph along, he's our tech expert. Um, and uh, this screen uh, with our Save the Whales, that will become uh, a bit apparent later. So who are we? We're a um, social enterprise. Uh, standby block producer and what we mean by social enterprise is that we want to have a high performing culture uh, we want to make profit uh, with our endeavors and we're, we're going to give a proportion of our profit to charities um, we're based in Australia and we have a very multicultural team so every one of us uh, comes from somewhere different so we've got Ralph who comes from Germany uh, Tom was originally from China myself Vietnamese and we've got a Canadian and an Aussie as well um, and so we would like to promote uh, scalable and efficient uh, block production. So achievements so far, we're currently hovering around number 29 to 35 um, on the EOS block producer uh, rankings. And um, yeah, so we're, we're around there. Uh, we've also developed our own EOS toolkit, uh, which has um, tools to help you manage your EOS on the EOS blockchain. And uh, Ralph will go into that a bit further. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, good feedback from the community uh, around the features and we've been developing it and uh, we've reskinned it and, and put new features like, for example, transferring your EOS recently. Uh, we're very high profile and we're engaged in the community as well, in Australia and also internationally. Um, so here's an example of uh, one of the uh, block producers, EOS Nation, endorsing our toolkit. So we've been endorsed by EOS Nation, um, EOS Cafe and EOS New York as well. So I'll hand over to Ralph, who can uh, talk you through all the technicalities of uh... um, Yeah, so we talked, about, we talked about Bitcoin a lot before. So I'm not sure if you have heard about the technology behind EOS. So EOS is using delegated proof of stake. And who knows what that is? There's quite a few. It's, that's good. Anybody wants to explain it? <laughs> or anybody has any? You. Oh, yeah. I'll win. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm sure I will. Um, yeah, so Bitcoin is using the, the proof of work mechanism. We heard just before from, from Hass that it's using quite a lot of energy, although useful, very useful. Um, so EOS is using delegated proof of stake, and it's, it's a completely different model. Um, there, was there was proof of stake as well, which is used by a couple of blockchains, so which means if you own coins, you have a stake in the network and you have, you're allowed to vote and use that um, for consensus mechanisms. With delegated proof of stake, um, there is uh, block producers, they call it. So um, it works a bit different. With Bitcoin, it's all about hash power. We, we talked about hash power quite a lot, so you need to have really strong machines. Uh, need to be up there all the all the way, always in, uh, improving your hardware technology so you get your your hash rate up. With delegated proof of stake, it's different. It's about votes, so you get you get voted in by the community. People who own EOS can decide who these 21 at the moment it is block producers are. But there's around 300 block producer candidates at the moment, so we are in hovering between 29 and 35 at the moment, depending on how the votes go. So not too bad. Um, we, are, we are completely self-funded at the moment, like there's big companies out there who are trying to be uh, block producers, and we are completely self-funded, so we are quite proud we've made it that far, um, starting just from a hobby, hobby project, and basically, yeah, making it already into, in the top 50. We, didn't, we were quite surprised by that success. Well, we were hoping for it, but still. It's a pretty big thing for us. So how, how it works with delegated proof of stake is once you get voted in, you, there is a schedule of producing blocks. So it's still the same concept of, of blocks, similar with Bitcoin, so there's a, there's a chain. And I think it needs a whole topic to explain why you need a chain. Um, I, I heard some conversations before uh, how, how it exactly works with Bitcoin. So in Delegated proof of stake, there is a schedule. Every block producer, all, all of those 21 block producers, get six seconds of producing blocks, and then the next block producer is producing blocks. 
And there's about, there's exactly two blocks per second being generated. So it's very predictable. So you have a very fast blockchain, you have very fast confirmation times. The irreversible block is normally within two seconds. So you can use it for very fast, for very um, high performance applications. That's some of the, the technical differences on a, on a high level. So, you know, with Bitcoin it takes like 10 minutes to have a block generated. You, you need to normally wait for up to six blocks for it to be considered solid and, and valid and um, yeah, proven not to be uh, invalidated by some other blocks that are generated after that. So uh, two seconds is pretty good in comparison. Um, so EOS is a, is a smart contract platform. Um, it will be used by a lot of dApps. So it's a, it's, so a lot of you will probably have heard of Ethereum. So it's a contender for Ethereum. Um, it's much faster, as, as you know. I'm not sure how fast exactly Ethereum is. Anybody knows here in the room? How many? 15, 15 per second? Yeah. So with uh, EOS, you are in the thousands of transactions, and that's not even considering sidechains. So um, EOS also comes with the ability to create sidechains. Um, at the moment, there's only one mainnet, and we are quite happy about that, that we even found the one mainnet. Uh, the people who've, who've been following that uh, would, have, would have seen some debate going on about how that network formed. Um, it's, it's, a very, it's actually quite political. So EOS has a governance mod model, uh, which is a bit different again to Bitcoin. You've, you've probably heard about uh, forks in Bitcoin. Yeah, sorry. So if someone forked the other, it's open source. Anyone can fork it. So what happens? Um, it's a big fork. Now you've all got to decide who to change the follow. That's true. That's why um, um, Block One came with the idea of waiting for 15% um, vote contribution until the main node was declared to be the main net. So the idea was if lots of people were about to start multiple EOS networks, um, you have to still, you have to vote to activate the main net. So that was the 15% uh, voting cap that was built into the software that we all agreed on, the people who were running for block producer. Um, and that's why we could finally agree on a, my, on a main net. There might still be forks happening, who knows, down the road. It all depends what the community wants, what, what's going to happen, but at least we have a mainnet right now. Um, so with our um, infrastructure, I'm not sure, I probably won't go into too much detail, but we are currently running a, a cloud-based instance, so we are actually running in Amazon. Um, there's lots of block producers who run bare metal. Um, we've decided because we are self-funded and everything to go low risk. Like we didn't want to buy like a $20 million server structure and not be voted in and not make any money and then sitting on this heap of metal. So we decided to go cloud-based and um, it's paid off so far. It's working very well for us, but we will revisit that down the road if, if we become more successful. Um, so that's our network infrastructure. Um, this is our um, our peers, so there are some other block producers here that we are connected to. Uh, we have um, a block producer, a couple of full nodes that are API servers, so for the DEP, uh, the DEP uh, develops that they can connect to one of our nodes if they want to connect into the EOS uh, chain and run their distributed apps on that. So voting and governance, we already touched on that because of your question. You, if, you are, if you have EOS, then you can vote. And if you do have EOS, we hope that you vote for us. <laughs> uh, and ideally, you are, you are aware with lots of EOS, so you can pop us up uh, in, the, in the voting range there. So every EOS counts as one vote, but you also can vote for up to 30 block producers with, with an EOS. The idea is to get as much uh, to distribute the votes evenly around the globe so that you have uh, block producers everywhere in the world. And currently, we are the top uh, block producer candidate here in Australia. So we are quite proud, proud of that. Uh, we hope that we actually make it into the top 21 so that there is a proper block producer in, in Australia. At the moment, we are a standby. What that means is 
the, the, run, the network is run by 21 active block producers. But if there's any one of them failing to produce their blocks or being found to be fraudulent by the majority uh, of the network, they can be voted out uh, and the standby will be popped into their position. So that's um, how this network is being run. Yeah. If, for instance, a whale is voted themselves into the number one block producer, how do they get voted out if they just act fraudulently and re-vote themselves back in? Well, we've, we've seen that actually happening already. So number one block producer is Bitfinex. So they have... I wasn't mentioning any names. <laughs> well, it's public. It's on the blockchain. So we might as well drop the names. <laughs> so yeah, there is definitely a concern around that. There is a big debate in the community. Um, so EOS has, a, has an arbitration process as well. So if you are not happy with that, you can claim an arbitration claim. And somebody might look into but if that. You're a whale, you can counteract that anyway. Probably. So I don't know. Um, I'm not. I mean, we are following the politics, but we are concentrating on our own goals. We are trying to be the good ones in the chain. So obviously, you could just drop the ball and say, okay, this is all shit. We just drop out of this. But we are trying to make this a good chain. That's we where we try to, to fight for, the, for this and try to be one of the top 21. That's our idea. Um, we think that's really <coughs> bad. If they are a whale and they own that, they have the right. Why is that a problem? If New South Wales has more votes than, than Tasmania, yeah. It has more rights. That comes with the deal. That's right. It's not a problem if they're not if they don't misuse that power. But in theory, they could uh, create 21 block producers and vote for all 21 block producers, and then they would be controlling the whole network. Because with one EOS, you can vote for up to 30 block producers. So that's the issue. That's the main issue. Uh, there's a couple of issues around that. There's lots of debate going on, and I hope the community will work it out. They can squeeze the competition out straight away. They can. They can. They can isolate it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. If that happens, and I think that is the only reason uh, when if uh, uh, that a hard fork might happen and that just a new chain is going to be created uh, without that. But that is kind of the only the only thing that I can see. No, 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 no. no. What I'm saying is that with Eos, though, I think you can only have one chain. Do you know what I mean? Well, do you, it's open source, right? It's open source, yeah, so you could just spin up your own instance or 21 of them and declare this to be EOS 2. If you wanted to, it's open source, you can do whatever you want with it, but you need the community behind it, right? Uh -huh. So if the community doesn't support you, you have a chain running, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the other topic was, was revenue, because you might be thinking, okay, we are number 35, there's 21 active ones, why are you earning money? So there's, there's two sides to that, to the income for block producers. There's block production rewards. So if you are in the top 21, you, you get paid per block that you actually generate, uh, which is quite predictable unless your servers are down. Um, then there's also vote pay for uh, the standbys because they want to make sure that there's more than just 21 block producers available. So the standbys get also a certain amount of money and that's uh, divided by the number of votes that you get. So the, the, we are currently in, in that range, so we are a paid standby. Um, around the top 55 are currently being paid. Anything below that isn't being paid at the moment. They're just standbys um, hoping for votes um, to actually generate money. So that will probably also change quite a bit going forward. So yeah, we talked briefly about our toolkit. Um, we can give a quick demo. Do you want to, to learn? I'm not a Mac user, so if I fail, please don't. <laughs> but we've got, um, we've got a contributor here as well. So if anything goes wrong, you can ask Andy. <laughs> he's, he's one of our contributors. So he, um, he was quite active in, in our channels. Like we are on Telegram, we are on all sorts of channels. And uh, we are quite glad to have him helping us out as well with this tool. And one of his colleagues, Gwentin, who had already had to leave tonight. But he was here earlier before as well. <coughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Much appreciated. Uh, when, the, when the mainnet started, uh, and I talked about the 15% vote to, to activate the network, um, the problem was it took about a week 
for that to be activated because there was just no wallet out there to vote. So the only people who were technical enough to actually install the command line were able to vote in the beginning. And then slowly people started to actually produce those wallets. Um, and we also decided to, to put one out. It was quite rudimentary in the beginning, but it went just through quite a bit of refactoring. Um, so that's what it looks like right now. Looks pretty slick, what I, I would say, thanks to the team. Um, and it's integrated with Scatter, which is something like MetaMask. So if you're using this tool, you're not actually putting your private key directly into a website, into our website. Scatter is, uh, is a browser extension uh, which works best with Chrome, but also, also supported by uh, uh, Firefox and I believe Safari. I'm not sure about Safari. I'm not sure. I, I just use Chrome. I, I only use Chrome and, and Firefox. Yeah. So we recommend, uh, definitely recommend Chrome. So here you can see, you can do, if you have, for example, registered um, in the, your ERC20 tokens and you had generated your EOS key previously and all that before the mainnet launch, you could look up your account name in here by just entering your EOS public key into, into that field here, and it would show the account name. Um, if you already know your account name, you can directly go here. For example, I can um, put our um, ours one <coughs> generous account here. We can have a look at that. So you can see publicly that we already made some income. You can see there's currently 2,000 EOS uh, in that chain, uh, in that account. Uh, we've bought quite a bit of RAM because of one of our endeavors down the track. And we didn't want uh, to buy the RAM when the price has gone up. So we, we went early. So you have to, in order to use the network, you need to stake some EOS, uh, which is also quite a bit of a difference in terms of uh, other networks like Ethereum. In Ethereum, for every transaction that you make, you have to pay gas. With, with the EOS network, you don't have to pay anything. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> so you, you just have to stake a bit of EOS, and then you get uh, a percentage of the network and a percentage of the CPU. So if you want to do, like, let's say, one transaction a day, uh, you can probably just stake 0.1 EOS uh, for network and 0.1. I just wanted to explain a little bit um, uh, the background of the staking. Um, so the idea with EOS is that um, we want to make it easy for the users to use the system. So. Uh, you don't actually have to pay for transactions, and that's why it should be quite popular with dev developers, because you, they don't have to make the users constantly buy gas uh, so that they can keep up using the application. Um, EOS has a different kind of model, and a lot of you, if you are investors, might not like it, but EOS is based on an inflationary model. So it's not a capped 21 million like with EOS. Um, they started with 1 billion EOS, and it has a 5% inflation rate. Um, that 5% inflation is used to fund the block production, and it's used to fund worker proposals to improve the network. So 1% of that goes to the block production. Isn't it a 5% cap? There's a cap, like yes. Zero yeah, it can be voted by the community, but it's currently 5%. It started with 5%, yeah. But that, that could also be voted to change. Yes, but it can't be voted up. It can only be voted down. Oh, so it's absolute cap. Yeah, unless they, yeah, unless they change the actual software completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, everything can change. That's in code, <laughs> um, but that's how it's how it's set. So that's how the network is being self-funded by the inflation, and you don't have to pay for anything. You just have to stake enough EOS. So if you want, if you're a DAP developer, you need to buy a certain amount of EOS. Let's say 500 EOS or whatever it is. Uh, depends on how, how many users you have, how many transactions you're going to make on the network. Um, and you stake some of it for network usage, like a uh, number of bytes going over the network, uh, and for the CPU. Uh, because the 21 block producers are actually doing the calculations of your currently C++ code, which is the same, uh, compiled into a resin and so on. Um, but that's, that's how it works, so you need to stake um, some EOS to use the network. And you can also buy RAM 
if you need to store additional data uh, about your users, for example. Block one is also working on file system integration, but that's not, not out yet. So at the moment, everything that you need to store is stored in run. So you can use our toolkit to look up your account. You can uh, create an account. We're going via 3G, so it's a bit slow, or 4G, if you're lucky. So you can create an account, um, connect account. Con we'll see if we're still locked into Scatter. Yes, we are. So scatter, select identity. You need to select which identity what you want to interact with, and then you accept that. So now you can see it's pre-filled the creator um, field, which is Aussie Thai, one, two, three. This is obviously Thai's account. If you wanted to create another account, it has to be 12 characters, which is um, currently a limitation or a, explicitly set as a limitation uh, for an, to avoid name squatting. So it has to be exactly 12 characters. You can also bid on names, on, on premium names if you want to. That's not in our latest tool. If, if you wanted to use that, you have to use our old tool. But maybe one of our contributors will migrate it onto our new tool soon. Nathan, who's our main developer, unfortunately can't make it tonight. Otherwise, we could ask him for time frames. So I could create an account called Smart Contract One, Two, Three, whatever it is, it didn't count. And I would have to give it a public public key for an owner key and an active key, which I can generate within Scatter as well. I won't go through all of that right now. And then I need to stake uh, how much I want to give this. For example, I could stake 13 EOS for network bandwidth, and 20 years for CPU bandwidth, depending on my estimate of how much my smart contract or DAP will use. And I can buy a certain amount of RAM straight away. You need at least four kilobyte to, to even create the account. So the default value is eight kilobyte. And then you can choose if you want to actually transfer the staked EOS to the account, which means you're kind of giving it away. You're actually giving it to the new account that you're creating. Or you can not transfer it, and that way you still own the EOS, but you're staking it into the new account so they can actually use it, which is uh, another quite powerful feature of the EOS blockchain. Um, the other very powerful feature of the EOS blockchain is um, permission management. So I mentioned already that it has an active and an owner key, which are the two default permissions. But you can have many, many layers within that. So you can make that, first of all, you could, can make any of that uh, multi-sig account. So maybe one step back. Um, the, the active key is the key that you should use for your day-to-day -day operations. Like if you want to transfer or stake, uh, or if you want to create an account. The owner key controls the actual account. So, what that is used for is for security reasons. You should put that one probably in cold storage or whatever, and only take it out if you need to make changes to the, um, to the active account. For example, if you suspect that somebody stole your private key of the active account. In that case, you can use your owner account to override your active account and just generate a new key pair, and, and then your, your account is safe again. What staking also gives you, uh, it gives you a kind of security mechanism because it takes three days to unstake uh, your, your coins, which means if somebody steals your active key, they can't just quickly transfer it to another account. They actually have to unstake it first, wait for three days, and then they can transfer it, which means you have three days to fix, your, fix the security issue. And well, you don't even have to raise a case. You can just change your, your active key because you still need, again, the same active key to then transfer the EOS. So we recommend that you stake most of your EOS and only leave a small amount uh, liquid for your day-to-day -day, uh, trading, if you do trading. Um, and you also can use your staked accounts only to vote. So if you want to vote for us, <laughs> please stake your, your EOS. And Hit the, the top vote for generous button 
and then you're all set, you've voted for us. You can also um, vote for a few more block producers if you want to go to the, to the um, yeah, we, once, once we've developed this one. You have to look that one up in our old uh, toolkit as well if you, if you want to use that. Um, that's probably enough about the tool kit for now. If you have any questions, you can still ask us afterwards. We'll still be around for a bit. So this is just what I already talked about in terms of the owner key and the active key. So you can split that further down into sub keys. So if you wanted to have a family key that, um, that is relatively restrictive, you could then create another so you can uh, give some permissions of your active key to some of your family members, create separate key set or permission set for them, and even for friends, uh, if you want them, for example, to vote for you, you could give them the permission to vote for you. You can also um, set a proxy for somebody to vote for you if you don't want to look into who all those different block producers are, because it's if you really want to put a lot of effort into into it, it yeah. It's, it's a lot of block producers that you would have to, have to research to find the ones that you are happy to run the network. And if you don't want to do that, you can set a proxy to do this kind of work for you. Uh, that's probably enough for account management as well. So if you have any more questions, we are happy to, to answer as much as we can. One or two people chopping at the bit to, uh, <laughs> to ask some questions. So, the, well, I think uh, <laughs> the, the account creation. So, so yeah. with with the account creation, when you you choose your name, it's. I, I thought prior to tonight, it was you were actually renaming your current account, but you're not actually doing. You're actually no. creating one with a new name. So then you. Yeah, you can't you rename your account. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. You create a new account, and you can decide to transfer all your. Uh, EOS to that account, or transfer parts of it, or only stake parts of it. Yeah. yeah. And with this uh, proxy voting system, wouldn't you still have to research whoever you, because you're delegating a, like a proxy voter, you still have to do your research on your proxy. That's you? that's right. So, but the idea behind it is that there might be less less of those than there will be block producers. But you can, you can choose what you want to do. You can either vote for the block producers themselves, or you can delegate it. For example, if you, if you like an exchange uh, being the ones voting for you, you could delegate a proxy, like a, uh, an exchange that have become a proxy. <laughs> there are a couple of um, places to go to. So there is one uh, group called EOS, EOS Go. They've created a forum, and all the block producers there have registered and put a lot of background information about themselves there. They even created a whole portal. You can search um, um, that portal. You, you can also have a look at the map. So if you want to, uh, to vote for Australian block producers, you can find the ones that are in Australia. Um, hopefully, people are voting relatively equally around the globe so that there's block producers in every, well, not in every, but uh, in most most countries. Yeah, I think expanding on that, that's how I personally, or me and Quinton found you guys, is the map was really great. And then you kind of look who, who's your, you know, you know, your local block producing candidate and we found you that way. Oh, great. <laughs> Uh, can you explain to me the RAM a little bit more? Because I'm so confused about yeah. it. Because now I've been hearing about people have been buying up RAM and RAM's going parabolic like <laughs> five times of what it was last week or something like that. It's crazy. Um, because my understanding of EOS is like you said, you buy it to buy your place on the network. So then if you want to send transactions or have a DAP that sends a lot of transactions, you've got to own a lot of EOS to have that stake on the network to be able to send those transactions. So then how does RAM then factor into that? And then if I buy RAM, do I then lose my EOS, which means I lose my stake in sending transactions? The whole thing is <laughs> That's <laughs> right. You buy yeah. RAM with EOS, is that what you That's right. Yeah, you buy RAM with EOS, yes. So you lose stake. Yeah, you have to, yes, you will use some of that, definitely. That's right. Um, the idea behind RAM usage is really for people, for example, if you want to do an airdrop, like you want to ge generate your own token, you need, you need RAM to store all that information, who, who has all your tokens, the ones that you created. 
For the normal, for the average user, you don't need to buy any RAM. So don't worry about that. You probably don't even need to stake more than one EOS because you're not going to make hundreds of transactions a day. So we still recommend staking for security reasons and so that you can vote. <laughs> Uh, but you don't have to do actually so, much there. So then as an individual user, like I can just sell my RAM and I won't, I probably won't need it? Yeah, if, if you have bought RAM, you can wait for the RAM price to go up and then sell it again. So there's a little bit of speculation possible, but I so, point... But like, so if I've got a few hundred, um, I've never bought any RAM. Do I own RAM? I don't even know. No, if you haven't bought RAM, then oh, you don't own any RAM. Okay. Right. No. Okay. I yeah, you would have a little bit. That's right. I mean, when when the network was created, um, the Genesis block and all of that, like all the snapshot from the ERC20 token, we had to give you a little bit of RAM in the blockchain to even store your account name and your public key. Okay. That's the RAM that you're seeing in your account when oh, you look so it up. it's not my RAM. It's just what's allocated. To it's your RAM, but you can't you can't give it away because otherwise there's no way to store your account yeah. anymore. <laughs> so it's the bare, the bare minimum. For, for it's the bare minimum. Yeah. Account, right? That's right. Well, yeah, just to add on that, so Tom. Yeah. Sorry, just to add on that. So when you buy RAM, you pay for it with EOS, and then when you sell it, preferably at a higher rate, you're selling it back into EOS, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Makes makes good sense. RAM was always there as a concept, but it wasn't probably communicated well before that. Um, but what really, I think what, um, yeah, it's, it's considered like real estate a little bit. I, I've heard that comparison before, but it's really, you buy a stake into the network like you buy real estate, and then you can use that real estate. I'm not sure if it's a good comparison, but I've heard it before. Yeah. Other people have used it, but you, you, you buy a little bit of network power and processing power in, in the network, and you can purchase RAM if you need to, but normally you don't. Like, not the average user doesn't yeah, do that. Yeah. Hi, um, just, just clarify something you mentioned before. Um, you basically said that Bitfinex has enough coins to effectively vote 21 producers in. If theoretically doing a 100% attack? Yes, they could. Okay, of course, that will collapse the value of the whole network, but they, so that's, uh, that's a fundamental flaw in the chain. That's a fundamental issue, and then we would have to hard fork them out. Uh, that's the only, I think... The arbitration is for, that's why they have, yeah. the, they have the Supreme Court or the High Court, which is arbitration. Which yes, that's how right. How the law works is that you can't interpret, unlike Bitcoin or Ethereum, which is if then that, that, if then, then that, they work on hard code. But the, my understanding of the arbitration is that the hard code sometimes fails. Therefore, you need the court system interprets the meaning of the law. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I have to point out that in case of this attack vector that you just mentioned, even the arbitration process doesn't help anymore because the block producers are the ones who have to action the orders. And if they're owning all the block producers, they will not action the orders of the arbitration process. So in that case, the arbitration can't do anything. And we would have to hard fork and just start a different chain without them. So Danny boy is not as smart as you thought he was. But that's really the only scenario. The only scenario yeah. is that you can, the whole thing can collapse. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the only that's scenario. It doesn't seem like a particularly far-fetched one, though, does it? But, but the beauty that it's a governed, it's a governed uh, blockchain is that it can evolve. Well, and well, what it can do is that Xi Jinping, or the government, the Chinese Communist Party, could tell Bitfinex to do that, to collapse, yes. that, collapse that chain. Collapse because they have competing chains. Ah, <laughs> 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 You like turn up with a different t-shirt every show. Because they can go and collapse Bitcoin now. Yeah. yeah. The only thing is, is this isn't too far removed. Uh, it's actually not that too far removed from Bitcoin. Because if the four powerful miners in China, Bitmain and, and the other three, started to gang up and do a 51% attack on Bitcoin, then that would do such irreparable damage to the to the oh, network. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a known. Yeah. But they, mm. the problem with uh, four-minded 
I was having this discussion with a Chinese group. Is that if the four miners did try to do a 51 collude, they have the Byzantine problem between the four miners. If one or two of the miners start moving away, they have a Byzantine general issue. They don't know which miner, which of the four to trust. But if the government tells them to do this, and they, they, they tell them because the Chinese have got 51% about two and a half years ago, they could basically make every transaction in the last two and a half, three years invalid. And the only thing you could do is you could fork it again and say, well, Bitcoin, cash, cash. <laughs> <laughs> but when, but the, main, the main chain would now be controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Because at the, they could control it from the time the Chinese got 51%. But the Chinese government can say to them, do this, and that's it for those channels. But that's why we'd fork it, and then everyone would abandon the. Sorry? That's and why it would be forked, the, they, they and then it would get abandoned Sorry? by the community. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in the next. The only thing with, with EOS, though, is this is a really good reason why we need decentralized exchanges, because this problem could effectively be solved if everybody owned their own private key on the EOS network and didn't leave their coins on Bitfinex. That's right. Then yeah. it would solve the problem. But with, 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 with Bitcoin, you can't get rid of Bitcoin. Then you have Ethereum. It's the same issue. If you go back to Ethereum and Bitcoin, you have all the same. The whole point of the semi centralization is to avoid the scaling problem of Ethereum and Bitcoin. If you did that, then now you're back to Ethereum. You're back to the second generation chain. No, not at all, because you still have the 21 block producers, but if you had decentralized exchanges and everybody owned their own private keys, um, yeah, you, you would get rid of the... You get rid of the point that no one could... Um, if you didn't have permission, you didn't have permission, you centralized to the point that no one individual group could control it, then you're back to the second generation change, you're back to the which is still heavily controlled anyway by China. Yeah, the problem is, like you said, the problem is the big whales, definitely. So we, we are hoping that the wealth will distribute because EOS, like I said, is a, it's an inflationary currency, right? So there will be more and more EOS and the EOS will be distributed, the new EOS coming in will, will be distributed through worker proposals, through all sorts of stuff. So we are hoping that this will go slowly uh, down this risk factor. What are the advantages of uh, staking other than voting? Uh, like I said, um, it gives you a bit of safety because nobody can immediately steal your EOS if they are staked. There's a three-day staking, unstaking process, which you can um, pretty much you can watch your wallet. There will probably eventually there will be notification apps if somebody unstakes your EOS, and then in that case you could just change your active key. So, so Ralph, you actually helped um, someone who yeah. who had their key stolen. Do you want to? Yeah. Share that story. Yeah. So we had we had people, and there were a couple of people who got hacked and fished. Uh, they got their active keys stolen. So they contacted the. Uh, there's the couple of groups that help with that, but also we help with that, uh, talking people through how they can change their active keys. So we talked them through uh, the processes using our toolkit, how to change their active key, uh, generate a new key pair, and that way they couldn't actually transfer the unstaked uh, tokens because they had three days to fix that. Okay, I think I saw another hand before. Was there another hand for questions? No. All right, well, I'm sure there's uh, plenty of debate we could go on with all night, but that's fine if you like. But yep. for now, we'll um, show our appreciation to Ralph and Ty.